This is Land of Havilah with the Gospel of Mark, the second book of the New Testament. We'll read the entire book without skipping anything and add some short comments as usual. We're reading from the World English Bible because it's very accurate to the original Greek and it's not copyrighted. Therefore, we can post the entire text without legal issues. Credit also goes to the NET Bible translation notes for explaining some of the Greek. The name Land of Havilah comes from Genesis 2.11. It's a place that has all the good stuff. The Gospel of Mark is the story of Jesus. The life of Jesus wouldn't be so believable if it weren't so thoroughly documented before, during, and after. Before, there were the prophecies of the Old Testament that predicted the details of it. During, there were the four Gospels that told it. And after, there was the rest of the New Testament that confirmed it. Put together, the Old and New Testaments are a consistent testimony by many authors and eyewitnesses over a 2,000-year period. Most importantly, there's a certainty of it that God places directly in us. Now the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Comment. Verse 1 says this is going to be, quote, the good news of Jesus Christ, end quote. The good news goes on and on. There's so much of it, it's hard to know where to start. It has to do with everything within a person, turning his existence from dark to light, from being alone to having the Holy Spirit inside him, and all the benefits that entails. Jesus called that part of the good news abundant life. And it has to do with a bright eternal future, which he called eternal life. Coming up, before Jesus came on the scene, God raised up a prophet to announce him and introduce him. Verse 4, John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching the baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. All the country of Judea and all those of Jerusalem went out to him. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John was clothed with camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. He preached, saying, after me comes he who is mightier than I, the thong of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and loosen. I baptize you in water, but he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Comment. In verses 4 and 6, John the Baptist was a very different and radical sort of person. He detached himself from society and lived in the wilderness, meaning in the desert. He wore rough clothing, a coat of camel hair and a leather belt and ate whatever he could get his hands on, which was locusts and wild honey. He was reminiscent of the Old Testament prophet Elijah in the way he lived and dressed, the way he kept himself out of the mainstream, 2 Kings 1.8 and John 1.21. In verse 5, people were coming to the desert to hear John preach, and if they accepted his message and were serious about it, they confessed their sins on the spot, which took a lot of humility, and were baptized. Thus, we call him John the Baptist. According to John, confession and baptism were attached to a promise that God would forgive sin because it said in verse 4, it was a, quote, baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins, end quote. It was all in preparedness for receiving the coming mighty one, as John called him in verse 7. In verse 3, John's arrival on the scene was the fulfillment of a prophecy from Isaiah 40, verse 3, quote, a voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness, make smooth in the desert a highway for our God, end quote. The most exciting part of the message was in verse 8, that the coming mighty one would baptize men in the Holy Spirit. In other words, as water baptism was an individual thing, the coming mighty one would individually baptize men with the Holy Spirit, immerse them with the Holy Spirit, flood them with the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.33. After John had been setting the stage for a while, verse 9, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. A voice came out of the sky, You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Comment. In verse 9, Mark skipped over the events surrounding Jesus' birth and childhood and went straight to Jesus at about age 30, Luke 3.23. 
when Jesus came to John at the Jordan River for baptism. In verse 10, John baptized Jesus, Jesus came up from the water, and the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus. It wasn't until after this, after the Holy Spirit was on him, that Jesus started preaching and performing miracles. He did all his works by the power of the Holy Spirit, Luke 4, 18. In verses 10 and 11, when Jesus came up from the water, there was another sign, in addition to the Holy Spirit coming down, there was a voice from the sky that said, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. There are going to be many things coming up that identify Jesus for who He is, but this is one of the most explicit. It'll happen again on the Mount of Transfiguration that the Father will speak audibly about Him one more time. As far as God saying, This is my beloved Son, Mark didn't mention it, but Jesus was the product of a virgin birth. His mother was pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit, Luke 1, 34 and 35. Thus, Jesus was the Son of God in that sense of how the pregnancy came about, and now He's the Son of God in another sense that He carries the Spirit of God in Him. So what effect will the Spirit of God have on Him? Verse 12, Immediately the Spirit drove Him out into the wilderness, He was there in the wilderness, forty days, tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels were serving him. Comment. There's more about Jesus' forty days in the desert in Matthew 4 and Luke 4. He had nothing to eat during that time, and at the end, when he was weak and hungry, Satan presented him with three temptations, to make bread from stones, which Jesus rejected, to accept power and glory from Satan, which he also rejected, and to test God to see whether God was with him, which Jesus also rejected. Afterward, in verse 13, angels came and served him, which might indicate he was too weak to survive at that point without assistance. So even at the point of death, at his weakest, he refused to be corrupted by sin and Satan. As far as receiving angelic assistance at the end, there's an open promise of heavenly assistance that's applicable to anyone, quote, The eyes of the Lord range to and fro across the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. 2 Chronicles 16, 9. Jesus proved where his heart was. Even at his weakest point, his heart was with God the Father, and the Father strongly supported him. Coming up, what will the Spirit of God that's resting on Jesus lead him to do next? Verse 14. Now, after John was taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the good news of God's kingdom, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and God's kingdom is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news. Comment. In verse 14, John was arrested, and Jesus started preaching in the region of Galilee. In verse 15, he said, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. His listeners were familiar with the Old Testament, which teaches the following. A thousand years earlier, in the most glorious years of the kingdom of Israel, King David was on the throne. God promised David that he would have a certain descendant on the throne and that the throne would last forever, 2 Samuel 7, 12, and 13. The way it was written, you couldn't tell if it was one descendant that would be on the throne forever or one descendant that would establish the throne and the throne would last forever. Everyone assumed it would be the second because how could anyone live forever and be on the throne forever? But it turned out to be the first that someone would live forever to occupy the throne. It turned out to be Jesus. Jesus' taking of the throne would be in the same way David took the throne. David's life was a prophetic uh, pronouncement of what would happen to Jesus. In David's time, the prophet Samuel declared David to be king of Israel when David was a young shepherd boy. At the time, there was another king on the throne, King Saul, because God put Saul there, And though David was the new king by God's declaration, it was a very long time before David actually took the throne. During that time, David trusted God and simply waited for God to hand him the throne. He didn't wrestle the throne to himself. As David grew older and more powerful, he could have easily taken the throne for himself, but he didn't. He wanted it to be according to God's doing and God's timing. In the meantime, some of the men of Israel left the kingdom of the illegitimate king to join themselves to David so that when David became king, the ones that came over to him beforehand became his trusted men. Jesus would take the throne the same way. God declared Jesus to be king of all, Matthew 28, 18, 
and Jesus is king of all, but to this day Jesus hasn't done anything to wrestle the throne to himself. He could, having all power and legions of angels at his disposal, Matthew 26, 53, but to this day he's staying patient, waiting for the Father to fully hand him the throne. This is according to the Father's instructions, which were, quote, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet, Psalm 110, 1 and 1 Corinthians 15, 25. Therefore, Jesus was and is patient with all his enemies. He was even obedient to the death, but God raised him up, and one day the Father will fully hand him the kingdom. In the meantime, some of us are coming out of the kingdom of this present world to join Jesus. When Jesus comes into his full kingdom, we'll be his trusted men and women, 2 Timothy 2.12. So the kingdom of God is an evolving thing. It's already a thing by God's declaration, and Jesus is already the king of it. Some of us has, have come out of the world to join him, and the kingdom is within us already by the Holy Spirit in us. But one day when God brings the kingdom in its fullness, it'll be an open and visible thing with all opposition being disposed of, and Christ will be the undisputed king of all, the same way David eventually became the undisputed king of all Israel and master of all the surrounding nations. So in verse 15, when Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand, there was a lot of Old Testament background to that of the kingdom of heaven, but the public didn't understand that the fullness of the visible kingdom wouldn't come immediately. The kingdom was at hand, as Jesus said, in that the king was present with them, and men would be baptized in the Holy Spirit, but the visible outward kingdom wouldn't come in their lifetimes. Verse 16. Passing along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Jesus said to them, Come after me, and I will make you into fishers for men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little further from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. Comment, we know Simon better by his nickname Peter, Mark 3.16, and the name John popped up again, but obviously this is a different John, John the fisherman who became John the disciple. Peter and Andrew were brothers, as were James and John. The four of them were partners in the fishing business, Luke 5.10, so they already knew each other well. There's some background in John 1 and Luke 4 and 5 of why they all left the nets and followed Jesus. The order of all the events isn't clear, but before Jesus said, come after me or come follow me, in verse 17, Peter and Andrew were already familiar with Jesus from the Jordan River. Then back in Galilee, they listened to Jesus preach by the seashore and saw him do a miracle of an amazing catch of fish, Luke 5, 7. So they didn't just jump up and follow with no history behind it, but Mark was brief and didn't include some of the details. In verse 17, Jesus famously said he would make Peter and Andrew fishers for men. In the end, Jesus commanded them to, quote, go into all the world and preach the good news to the whole creation, Mark 16, 15. So that's what Jesus meant by being fishers for men. They were going to captivate men with the story of what they were about to witness. Mark 1b is next at landofhavila.net. If you're watching by video, you can follow the links there to the next episode very easily. Havila is H-A-V-I-L-A-H, landofhavila.net.